Volume Three, Chapter Nine of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith, Volume Three, Chapter Nine. Willoughby notwithstanding every effort and every art made use of to detain him pursued his way to england but at paris the fatigue he had undergone and the anxiety which had so long waited on his spirits combined to throw him into one of those fevers to which from his infancy he had been subject and for three weeks he was in the most imminent danger amid the wild ravings of the delirium that perpetually occurred during the severest paradoxums of the complaint he called incessantly on celestina and complaining that lady castlenorth had taken her from him entreated of his servant a man who had lived with him for some years to send for her that he might see her before he died this in the simplicity of his heart his faithful attendant would have done having no idea that anything could be of more consequence than the wishes of his dear master who whose life he was so cruelly alarmed but when he asked him whither he was to send willoughby put his hand on his heart sighed deeply and replied either that he did not know or that it would be of no effect for that indifferent what became of him she had already refused to come to him and was gone to scotland with vasiver when the violence of the disease subsided he ceased to name her and his servant afraid of renewing his recollection carefully avoided any hint of what he had dwelt upon during his delirious ravings slowly and with two relapses he recovered strength enough to proceed to calais but nine weeks had elapsed since the information he had received from vassiver and it was nearly three months after that time before he arrived in london his first inquiry was after vassiver who was he found in staffordshire and his heart was relieved by the intelligence for he dreaded lest he should have met him in london perhaps married to celestina his next was after his sister whom he still loved and in favour of whom he was willing to forget all the neglect he had experienced from her as well as the causes of displeasure given him by her husband after celestina he feared to ask by a direct message to herself and he therefore sought somebody who could tell where she now was of which he concluded he should have intelligence from lady molino lady molino attended his summons and while he embraced her with tears of fraternal fondness from a thousand tender recollections that crowded on his heart he saw her equally unmoved by their meeting and unconcerned at his illness of which he still retained melancholy proofs in his altered countenance and reduced figure he took an early opportunity of turning the discourse on celestina and saw with increased amazement that far from being interested in the inquiry which had occupied his whole thoughts so long matilda was perfectly indifferent about it or if he moved her a moment from the stillness of fashionable apathy she shrunk from the subject with something like disgust seemed afraid of the trouble of investigation and careless how it might terminate wishing rather to hear nothing about it than to hazard not the tarnishing her mother's honour for to that she seemed insensible but the probability of being obliged to own for a sister one whom she had hitherto considered as a dependent 
and of seeing her brother from a point of honor undertake to provide for her as a relation advice the heterogeneous child of selfish vanity was become a leading feature in the character of matilda she found so many uses for money in adoring and indulging herself that she loved nothing so well except the adulation it procured for her and so much power has this odious passion to pervert the heart that instead of feeling concern in contemplating the sunken features and the pallid cheek of her brother she could not nor indeed did she attempt to cheek a half-formed idea of the pecuniary advantage she should receive from his death while such were her thoughts willoughby asked her when she had last seen celestina oh replied she i have seen her only once in a room and that was by accident i was never at home when she called and i hate that old lady horatia howard that she lives with and so took no great pains to meet them when i returned her visit i have seen her though in public five or six times lately but the girl seemed to me so very much altered and to give herself such intolerable airs that i rather shunned than sought her airs cried willoughby she must indeed be greatly changed if she deserves such censure but tell me matilda what kind of airs oh the airs of beauty answered she which you first taught her to assume and which she has made a tolerable progress in since this old cat of fashion has taken into her head to make such a fuss about her and since she has been surrounded with such a set of senseless boys there's your friend vassiver constantly one of her suit and there was a notion of his being fool enough to marry her but i fancy that was given out merely by her exorbitant vanity for i dare say vassiver knows better the heart of willoughby sunk with him but he was unable to express what he felt and lady molyneux went on however i have heard since i think that the girl has been addressed by another young fellow one of the thoroughs i think whom i have lately seen with her which would be more suitable and more likely to be a match you have seen her then often said willoughby in a faint and faltering voice yes in public replied his sister but i have had no conversation with her lady molyneux then changed the conversation and soon afterwards left her brother more unhappy than she had found him he was by no means able to see celestina in his present state of wretched uncertainty yet to know that by traversing two or three streets he could once more behold her once more gaze on that lovely countenance and hear that voice so soothing so enchanting to his ears was to him a state of tantalizing misery from which he knew nothing could relieve him but detecting the falsehood of lady castlenorth's report and this he could only hope to do by another journey into yorkshire in order to find that hannah bisco to whom he now thought he had certainly obtained a direction and this he proposed doing immediately celestina however surrounded by crowds of admirers celestina forgetting all the tenderness she once felt for him and rendering all his researches fruitless even if they proved to him that he might again plead for the renewal of that affection was an idea that increasingly tormented him and so painfully did the intelligence affect him when lady molino had given that the ferment of his spirits produced a return of his fever in a slighter degree but still so as to confine him to his room where in a few days 
he received a visit from Vassiver. Vassiver was totally unconscious of the species of distress which Willoughby suffered, and since he himself had resigned her and agreed to complete his engagements with his family, with the family of Castle North, for so his conduct had been generally understood in England, had no notion that the address of another and particularly of his friend could be otherwise than pleasing to him he began therefore without remarking the concern and coldness of willoughby imputing it only to his visibly deranged health to relate to him his own views in regard to celestina and to complain of her preference of montague thurgood the devil take me the devil take me said he if there is in england or in europe another woman for whom i would take a fifth part of the trouble which this bewitching girl has already given me curse me if i am not ashamed of myself when i think of what a whining puppy she has made of me ten times i have left her and ten times have returned to prove to her that she might use me like a dog miss de moray said willoughby in a voice affected by the various sensations he felt miss de moray must be greatly changed sir if she is ca become capable of any improper levity towards any gentleman who professes regard for her at the same time you will recollect mr vassiver that she is mistress of herself and at liberty to reject those whose offers may not be acceptable to her from the experiments which you have been pleased to make though from our long friendship i should rather have expected you to have applied to me before you make them from the experiments you have been pleased to make it seems clear that miss de moray has no favourable intentions towards you and i would advise you by all means to decline the pursuit may i perish if i do replied vassiver with all his usual impudency no george unless i can be made to appear that young thoroughgood that little crutinizing fellow without a shilling and without nothing but his impudence and scraps of plays to recommend him has better pretensions than i have curse me if i will give it up this second imitation of celestina's encouraging the address of montague thoroughgood was a second dagger in the sick heart of willoughby he dreaded an explanation which while it might serve perhaps to subdue all his fears as to vassiver might create others equally unsupportable he could not however remain many minutes in the breathless agitation of such suspense and therefore said i really don't know anything about thoroughgood i hardly recollect that there was such a man what exclaimed vassiver not know him not know that she went immediately from alvanstone to the house of that old priest's father yes answered willoughby that i certainly knew for it was by my request that the elder mr thoroughgood become her guardian well nothing was so natural i suppose as for his reference to delegate the trust ought to his son and as his deputy i suppose it was that he went with his ward to scotland and was her guardian all the time she was among the highlands and the islands impossible cried willoughby he could not could not have been there he was by heaven exclaimed vassiver and when i met celestina with your letter at york I found that young fellow attending on her and Mrs. Elphinstone, but I was authorized by yourself to wait on her, and I obliged him 
there to resign a post which when i think of having so long filled and apparently with her approbation by all that's diabolical i could tear his puranical soul out nothing that willoughby had ever felt was equal to the anguish which pressed on his heart at this moment the coldness he fancied he had found in celestina's last letter was now accounted for and all the warmth of grateful praise with which in her former letters she had spoken of mr thoroughgood was imputed to her growing affection for his son lost as she might be and probably was to him for ever before this intelligence unless he could content himself with that share of sisterly affection which was all she ought to bestow there was something so terrible to his imagination in her feeling a warm attachment to another that he could not think of it without horror nor conceal from vassiver the effect it had upon him his mildness of matters forsook him and speaking less like himself than like vassiver whose vehemence he seemed to adopt he cried in a voice that trembled with passion how dared he pretend to celestina he not only dared then interrupted vassiver but dares still and has contrived to get lady horosha howard to be of his party he has fascinated the old woman with his piety and his poetry and i see very plainly that the young one will throw herself away upon him unless you prevent it may i perish cried he if i do not yet at that moment the recollection too forcibly occurred to him that he had no right to prevent it unless by urging a claim as her relation from which his soul recoiled so painfully acute were his present sensations that he was unable to breathe and without attending longer to the exhortations of vassifers who eagerly pressed him to interfere immediately he abruptly left the room and sent by his servant a message to vassifer saying he found himself so ill that he was gone to bed but should be glad he would call again for an hour in the evening instead however of attempting to procure that repose which his increased fever required he went to the trunk where celestina's letters were deposited and with trembling hands taking them out he ran them over even from the first she wrote to him after their separation to the last which mr jarvis had delivered to him at naples his apprehensive jealousy so powerfully awakened now taught him to fancy that from the moment of celestina's acquaintance with montague thoroughgood her letters had become gradually cooler and that the last too plainly evinced her cheerful acquiescence to that reluctant and only conditional resignation which b had with so much anguish of heart been compelled to send her while he explained the cruel circumstances that had torn him from her and from happiness the longer he dwelt on her letters the more this idea was strengthened and the more insupportable it became his illness originally occasioned by anxiety returned upon him and though without delirium his fever was nearly as high as when he was in so much danger at paris he now determined to send to lady horosia howard and he attempted to write to her but he could hardly command his pen and found himself wholly unequal to the more difficult task of composing such a letter as could alone be proper he threw away the paper in despair and calling his servant ordered him to find out immediately 
some means of becoming acquainted with the servants of lady horatia howard and procure intelligence of what visitors were most at the house particularly if a mr thoroughgood of devonshire was there often the man hastened to enter on a task the man hastened to enter on a task by no means difficult to him he contrived the same afternoon to induce himself to one of the footmen of lady horatia at the porter house he frequented and learned that his mistress and her young friend of whom he spoke as of an angel were gone for a fortnight or three weeks on a visit into oxfordshire that mr vassifer used to be a good deal at the house when first lady horatia came to town that now he was much less frequently there but that mr thoroughgood was there almost every day and read to the ladies whole evenings who since these reading parties at home went much less into public than they had done before this intelligence distracted willoughby by redoubling every apprehension he had felt the man however was sent back for further information and bade to ask if mr thoroughgood was of their party in their present journey and if there was any talk among the servants of an intended marriage between him and Miss de Moray. In answer to these queries, he had the mortification of hearing that Montague Thoroughgood was to meet the ladies at Oxford, and that it was, in the family, generally understood that he was the accepted lover of Celestina, and highly approved by Lady Horatia. It was now that the corrosive jealousy that had long tormented him had a decided object, and fixed with the most envenomed power on the heart of Willoughby. The impossibility of his interfering to prevent Celestina giving herself to another while he himself remained in such a situation as the present, and dared not even see her, the little probability he saw of removing the doubts that distracted him and the apprehensions least if they were for ever effectually withdrawn celestina would rejoice that they were so the cruel idea of montague thoroughgood possessing that heart which he once knew to be all his own and the preference of that of that elegant mind of which he had with so much delight contemplated the improvement were thoughts that incessantly pursued and tormented him and he had no means of obtaining any information of the conduct of celestina or her return to town but by his servant who was now employed whole days to gather from the domestics of lady horatia intelligence which when obtained served only to increase his misery the anecdotes he gathered from his sister served too but to aggravate his distress yet when he saw her as he generally did once every day from whatever point the conversation sat out it always ended in questions about celestina and lady molyneux who had insensibly familiarized her mind to the idea of her brother's dying a bachelor in consequence of his early disappointment now sat with concern that his attachment to celestina though it prevented his marrying any other was yet so rooted in his heart that should he find as she believed he would the imagined relationship a mere fiction he would most undoubtedly return to her with more ardor than before they were parted and notwithstanding the embarrassed state of his affairs which every day became more serious would marry her and disappoint every view of fortune increase of fortune with her adverious ambition for some might otherwise accrue to her actuated therefore by very strange motives she cooperated with lady castlenorth in endeavouring to divide him from celestina 
while one was strengthening the barrier raised between them the other was trying to convince willoughby that he ought not to wish for its removal the means of doing this were she thought to keep him at a distance from celestina and to pique his pride by representing her as attached to another the first point was for the present secured by his illness and she took care so artfully to insinuate the second that aided as she was by the report of vassiver and by the continual repetitions of what he had seen on the journey from scotland that every hour the fatal impression sunk deeper into his heart and his reason or his reliance on celestina's affection had no sufficient power to resist it thus passed five or six days after his arrival in london he endeavoured to shake off his illness for by a journey into yorkshire which he could not till it was conquered undertake he could alone hope to obtain any satisfaction as to the original cause of their separation yet even from thence he now no longer dared to look forward to happiness which even while he was employed in attempting to regain it seemed escaping from him for ever but that he might undertake something to relieve himself from the wretched state he was in he was now in he put himself into the care of a physician and set about getting out of an illness he had hitherto neglected or rather indulged though very languid and with great deal of fever still about him he went to lady molyneux and a day or two afterwards as he found himself better from change of scene and of place he accompanied her on some of her visits and called in at a card party where she told him she must shrew herself for a quarter of an hour the rooms were full and lady bolido being notwithstanding her declaration that she should stay so short a time sat down to a card table willoughby sauntered into one of the apartments where the younger part of the company were seated at a commerce table where the first person that met his eyes was celestina elegantly dressed and more beautiful than ever with myriads of charms playing round her face and cheerfulness and pleasure dancing in her eyes while on one side sat a young man whom willoughby immediately recollected to be montague thoroughgood and on the other gentleman and on the other another gentleman who though he seemed to be more of a stranger to her was evidently charmed with her and unable to keep his eyes from her face fixed to the place where he stood unheeded among some other idle people who were looking on he remained gazing at her for several minutes his legs trembled so that it was with difficulty he supported himself his legs trembled so that it was with difficulty he supported himself and his heart beat as if it would break he debated with himself whether he should speak to her or retire unobserved but while he yet argued the point a smile and a whisper that passed between her and montague thoroughgood determined him to fly from the torments he felt and which he found it almost impossible to endure another moment he stepped hastily away to find his sister and entreat her to go but so deeply was he affected that weakened as he was by illness he staggered and might have fallen had not the shame of betraying so much weakness lent him resolution to reach a chair where he sat a moment to recover breath and recollection mortified tenderness and disappointed love gave him for an instant a cessation resembling hatred he fancied he could quit celestina never again to feel any interest in her fate but 
leaving her to the man she preferred strengthened himself against his fatal and till now invincible attachment by contemplating the fatal barrier which he had so long been trying to destroy and to believe that artifice rather than nature had placed between them of this cause of their separation no part had in fact been removed and he reproached himself for the absurdity folly and even vice of his present conduct having argued himself into what he thought a resolution to feel no longer for celestina he hurried to lady molino and told her that if her game was not nearly at an end he must leave her and go home in a chair as he found himself unable to bear the heat of the room his sister answered that she was only settling her winnings and would attend him in a moment if he would wait for her he agreed to do so and going to the door that led out into the next room he leaned against the side of it turning his eyes as much as possible from the apartment where celestina was lost in the painful sensations inflicted by distracting jealousy and bitter regret which he yet struggled to style he distinguished not the objects all to him uninteresting that moved before him a crowd of young people however who had just risen from their table were pressing into another room where refreshments were distributed he moved a little to make way for them when he saw close to him and even borne against him by her companions celestina herself her face was at first turned from him for she was speaking to montague thurgood who was on the other side but finding herself crowding against somebody she turned to apologize for the rudeness she was guilty of when the well-known figure the well-known face of willoughby emaciated and pale as they were instantly struck her an involuntary and faint shriek testified the impression they made and willoughby who caught the weak sound of her distressed voice was at first by an irresistible impulse hurried to her assistance but seeing the arm of montague thurgood supporting her and his countenance expressing all the interest he took in her emotion he imputed that emotion to her consciousness of her attachment to her new favorite and darting at her a look of impatient reproach he forced himself through the crowd and without looking back sat down breathless and trembling by lady molino who was at that moment coming forward to meet him the agitation of poor celestina could not be concealed nor could she for a moment or two escape from the inquiring eyes of those who remarked it as soon however as she could disengage herself from the throng she sat down hardly daring to inquire whether she had seen what was real or visionary she had returned from oxfordshire with lady horatia only the evening before and knew nothing of willoughby's being in england while in addition to the amazement the sight of him occasioned his apparent ill-health impressed her with concern and the displeasure with which he surveyed her with terror montague thurgood who had seen willoughby and whose eyes were never a moment away from celestina knew at once the cause of her distress he followed her little less affected than she was herself to a sofa where she had thrown herself and asked her in a faint and tremendous voice if he should fetch her anything she answered if you please so low that he scarce distinguished what she said but stepping a few paces from her he took a glass of lemonade from a servant and brought it to her she took it and carried it to her lips almost unconscious of what she did 
when montague thoroughgood leaned over the arm of the sofa on which she sat and watched the emotions of her countenance with all the solicitude he felt strongly painted on his own at the same moment willoughby appeared leading lady molino through the room the first objects that he saw as he approached the door were celestina and montague thoroughgood but having once seen them he turned hastily from them and seeming to give all his attention to his sister he disappeared celestina's eyes followed him with a look of inexpressible amazement and concern she seemed to be in a fearful dream and when she no longer saw him her eyes were fixed on the door through which he had gone out she heeded no longer what montague thoroughgood said to her but sat with a palpating heart and a pressed breath till lady horotia after twice speaking to her roused her from her half-formed and confused reflections by reminding her it was time to go she followed in silence where lady horotia led and at the coach door wished montague thoroughgood good night for the only distinct sensation she felt was a wish for his absence but lady horotia who was immediately going home desired him to return and sup with her which without knowing what he did he consented to though too conscious while he did it that celestina had rather be without him for as he handed her into the coach he felt her tremble so that she could hardly support herself and he heard the deep sigh burst from her heart as if it would break lady horotia had not seen willoughby and had no idea of celestina's sufferings she talked therefore in her usual way of the people they had seen and of some books that had been recommended to her till observing that celestina who usually bore her part in the conversation did not answer she inquired if she was not well pretty well i thank you ladyship replied celestina but i am uncommonly fatigued to-night and have the headache this answer satisfied lady horotia who continued to address herself to montague thoroughgood till they arrived in park street where celestina would immediately have gone to her own room so unfit was she for conversation and so unable to sustain it but lady horotia ordering her woman to bring a remedy for the headache of which celestina had complained and that had before been of service to her she rather than alarm her kind benefactress sat down near the supper-table to wait for it but so great an effect had the violent through short perturbation of her spirits had on her countenance that lady horotia immediately perceived it the headache cried she in surprise and taking celestina's hand my dear you have surely something worse the matter with you than a common headache pray dearest madame replied celestina pardon me if i am utterly unable to say what is the matter to-morrow i shall be better and i know you will forgive me till then the manner in which she uttered these few words as trembling and faint she advanced towards the door alarmed and surprised lady horotia she saw however by the countenance of montague thoroughgood that he could explain the cause of celestina's uneasiness she therefore suffered her to depart and immediately made the inquiry of him he instantly informed her of what he had seen and with no favorable description of the looks and manner of willoughby which he had indeed appeared to him to be extremely cruel and insulting towards celestina lady horotia with whom willoughby was no favorite and who extremely disliked his sister lady molno saw his conduct in the same point of view as thoroughgood 
represented it and after some conversation on the subject said that though she was much concerned for the shock celestina had received yet that upon the whole it might perhaps be better for her that this circumstance had happened for now said she i think she will possessing as she does so much proper pride be convinced that even if the story coming from lady castlenorth has no foundation as i myself suppose it has that still she ought not to indulge in her early prejudice in favor of a man who whatever he may have pretended or she may have believed never intended to act honorably by her and now only deserts but insults her thoroughgood heartily assented to this opinion and sat down to supper with a heart somewhat relieved from the extreme uneasiness which the emotion of celestina on the appearance of willoughby had given him still however he could not eat he could not converse but as soon as he could disengage himself he took leave of lady horatia and full of anxiety and trembling least all the hopes he had of late so fondly cherished should be blasted he returned to his lodgings end of volume three chapter nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume three chapter ten of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c celestina by charlotte turner smith volume three chapter ten celestina in retiring to her own room had hoped to recall her scattered and oppressed spirits and clearly recollect all that had befallen her but the angry the disdainful look which that countenance wore where she had been accustomed to see only the smiles of approbation or the tenderly anxious looks of love was the image still most prevalent in her mind joined to the painful idea of the ruined constitution of him whose life was ever dearer to her than her own the cruelty of his being in london of his going into public without ever having seen or wrote to her sunk deeply into her heart ah oh, willoughby exclaimed she is it thus we meet again after such a parting is this the end of all your assurances that you would ever be my friend that you would learn to consider me as your sister if we were indeed related alas is it thus then you throw me off entirely and seem sorry to remember that you ever saw me a flood of tears followed this cruel reflection but after weeping some time her pride came to her relief she remembered the haughty neglect with which lady molino had treated her and doubted not but that her influence with willoughby had prevailed on him to expel her for ever from that place in his regard with the very reasons on which he resigned her as his wife ought to give her as a defenceless and unhappy orphan dependent on his family she recollected now but too well the reserve and disdain the look of mingled anger and scorn which willoughby's features spoke as she saw him the second time leading out his sister her mind dwelt on the expression of his eyes as they first met hers when though he must have seen how much she was surprised 
and affected by the sight of him, he flew from her without one consoling word, though it was evident she could hardly support herself. "'All is over then,' cried she, "'that tender friendship which would have been the consolation of my life is at an end. Every tie that from our infancy united us is broken, and I have now no reliance but on the kindness of those who are comparatively strangers. Ah, it is generous thus to discard me, without even trying to soften the blow, but go, cruel, capricious man, go and enjoy with your opulent heiress all the affluence can give. Go and become callous and insensible to all those noble sentiments that once animated your bosom, which once rendered you so deservedly dear to me. They are gone. Willoughby, selfish, cruel, unfeeling, and insolent, is not the Willoughby to whom my heart was devoted. Why, therefore, should I be thus wretched about him? Why let his proud malignant sister triumph in knowing that I am mortified and unhappy? Let me try to drive his too painful remembrance from me, or at least to remember him only as a son of my beloved benefactress. At the mention of that revered name, however, all her newly acquired resolution forsook her. The memory of her tender, her first friend, was so intimately connected with that of Willoughby himself, that her tears flowed for both, and against the unkindness of the latter neither, neither her pride nor her reason could sustain her. A sleepless night succeeded to this conflicting evening, and it was not till towards morning that Celestina determined to write to Willoughby, entreating him still to allow her that place in his friendship, which no fault of hers had, she thought, forfeited, and assured him that whatever might be her destiny, her regard for him was unchangeable, though she would never intrude upon him with it. Her tenderness conquered her resentment, and the idea of what she owed to the son of her early friend, whatever might be his conduct towards her, came in aid of that long-rooted tenderness, and produced the resolution which she meant to execute in the morning. Having thus determined, her mind gradually became more tranquil, and her spirits being quite exhausted, she sunk into slumber but but the fainter threw still painful ideas of the evening before pursued her and after tormenting her with numberless wild terrors she fancied that she saw willoughby with the same menacing look he wore the preceding night with a dagger in his hand approaching and threatening her to plunge it into a heart which was he said perfidious and ungrateful and had been the means of driving him to guilt and despair from an image of such horror she wildly started and awakening found lady horatia howard sitting by her bedside holding one of her hands and gazing on her with great concern with the most soothing voice she spoke to celestina and endeavoured to quiet the excessive agitation of her spirits her reasonable and gentle arguments had their desired effect and celestina ashamed of appearing insensible to the solicitude of such a friend summoned all her resolution to her aid and was able in about an hour to attend the breakfast-table with something like composure her cheeks however had that still that crimson glow which the perturbed state of her mind had given them her eyes were heavy with tears which in despite of all her efforts continued to fill them when the image of willoughby pale and thin with anger flashing from his eyes and contempt trembling on his lips 
again arose in her imagination lady hiroshia looked at her with more than her usual tender complacency for it was when her fine open countenance expressed pensive sorrow that she was from her then particularly resembling the regretted brother of lady hiroshia to her more than usually interesting before the breakfast table was removed montague thorogood was introduced he was extremely dejected and hardly able to return the compliments of lady hiroshia who was always glad to see him and who had undoubtedly given him all her interest with celestina and more encouragement to pursue his suit than was perhaps strictly prudent since celestina though she could not avoid him thought she never could prevail upon herself to behave to him with unkindness and though his talents and conversation and perhaps that sort of respect idiolatry by which few women can help being gratified however they may wish to repress it were in some degree pleasing to her had yet repeatedly declared to lady hiroshia and to montague thoroughgood himself that she felt not and was persuaded she never could feel for him that tender preference without which she would never marry this declaration they both imputed to that affection for willoughby which the uncertainty of her own situation continued to nourish persuaded as they both were that willoughby had promised to become the husband of miss fitzhaman which everybody but celestina had long believed lady hiroshia doubted not but that the merit and attachment of montague thoroughgood the similarity of their taste celestina's regard for his father and the easy competence which with him she could possess and which she often declared was the condition of life she would prefer would altogether induce her to reward his ardent affection with her hand as soon as it became certain that willoughby either from interested motives or from conviction of their too near relationship absolutely and for ever relinquished all pretensions to it she was therefore glad that the accidental meeting which had so much affected celestina was likely to hasten this period and far from seeing it in the unfavorable light thoroughgood himself did she told him as soon as celestina left the room that for him no circumstance could be more favorable lady hiroshia had long since transferred entirely to montague thoroughgood those good wishes which she had first expressed towards vassiver his great fortune his handsome figure and his apparent affection for celestina had for some time interested her for him and she imputed his extravagant vivacity and even his violent irregularities to his youth and unchecked habits of gratification before her vassifer had at first so far restrained the intemperate sallies of his ungovernable temper that she was for some time disposed to think well of his heart and his understanding but soon finding that this semblance of moderation availed him not and that he gained nothing on the inflexible heart of celestina he became tired of it and relapsed into such a wild way of talking and a boasting action still wilder that lady hiroshia was no longer able to excuse him and though she still received him at her house with civility she entirely approved of the resolution celestina had made never to listen to him as a lover it was just at that period that montague thoroughgood who on celestina's first arrival in town had not availed himself of the permission he had obtained to see her 
came to solicit lady horosha that indulgence and accounted for his absence by relating a long illness his father had just escaped in which as mrs thoroughgood was absent with one of her daughters he had himself been only and constant attendant you know said he to celestina how much i love my father and how well he deserves that i should love him and you will easily imagine what must have been my anxiety when for so many nights and days i saw him experience the most excruciating tortures and knew his life to be in the most imminent danger even the reigning the triumphant passion of my heart my love my adoration of celestina was suspended in the pain and solicitude i suffered for my father his looks which were greatly changed since celestina saw him before witnessed how severe this pain and solicitude had been and celestina not only forgave but esteemed him the more for that neglect which had at first given her a slight degree of mortification from that time he had constantly visited at the house of lady horosia and from his power of amusing her by reading and conversation he was become so great a favorite that he had no rival in her good opinion but celestina herself it was at her request he had met them at oxford and gone with them to bath and bristol celestina who saw but too plainly that all this was but feeding a passion already fatal to the repose of a young man whom she highly esteemed had in vain remonstrated with lady horosia on the subject who answered that her present was that her presence was a sufficient protection and that as to his love he would not indulge it in the less for feeling being he would not indulge it the less for being refused the opportunity of speaking of it to this doctrine celestina could not assent but in her situation too different was of little effect and all she could do to counteract the effects of this industry indulgence of lady horosia towards montague thoroughgood was to declare him very solemnly whenever he introduced the subject of his love which was whenever they were alone that through her esteem and regard for him was very great she could never think of him otherwise than as her friend and when he answered that content with that esteem and regard he should be the happiest of mankind to be permitted by time and tenderness to win her love she very frankly assured him that the sentiments which were once hers for willoughby though towards him they might be at an end could never she was well assured be transferred to another montague thoroughgood however young sanguine and violently in love was not easily discouraged while the favour of lady horosia the wishes of his father and the complacency and kindness with which notwithstanding her repeated declarations celestina treated him all contributed to cherish a passion which insensibly absorbed his whole soul every action every sentiment every look of celestina at once increased and justified this excessive passion and he lived now only to think of her when he was absent or gaze on her with adoration when she was present whenever he knew she was to be at any public place information which he was very assiduous and very successful in obtaining thither he went also and though unless he was invited he never introduced himself into the parties she was with he contrived so to place himself as to be able to see her and was content 
the extreme dejection with which he had on the last morning entered the house of lady hirosha all fled before her assurances that the meeting between willoughby and celestina however she might for a little time be affected by it would prove an advantage to him elated more than ever by hope he left lady hirosha having obtained leave to meet them at the opera whither they were going that evening but with poor celestina it was very different hope had now wholly forsaken her yet she still clung even to despair when it gave her an excuse for dwelling on the beloved and regretted name of willoughby she took out of her dressing-box a locket which his hair was interwoven with that of his mother and of his sister and which she had been used when a child to wear round her neck she looked at it a moment and remembered a thousand circumstances that brought the tears again into her eyes she kissed it she put it to her heart and that soft heart melting as the tender images this slight memorial presented to it the resentment which her pride had made her feel the evening before was forgotten while unable to bear the thoughts of having seen the last of willoughby of his having taken an accidental but eternal leave of her with anger and scorn she determined instantly to execute her purpose formed the evening before and with trembling and uncertain hand wrote as follows do not think dear willoughby that the unfortunate celestina means to intrade upon you with her complaints or to trouble you after the present moment even with her name but when those recollections which she cannot all at once subdue press upon her heart she finds it impossible quite impossible to submit to take of you an internal farewell without entreating that thought we never meet again we may part in peace with each other i might indeed urge to you willoughby that if the account you gave me of our supposed relationship be realized it ought not to excite your anger but to give me a claim to your protection if my heart did not i know not why revolt from the idea of being so near your relation i might on that score claim your protection and your pity i might be permitted surely to love you as my brother since alas whether you permit it or no i must still love you but with an affection so disinterested and pure that be my situation in regard to you what it may i feel nothing for which i ought to blush you look very ill willoughby you look unhappy and on me you look unkindly i do not ask to see you since my accidentally meeting you was evidently painful to you but i ask to have a few lines from you to tell me that you are not ill that you are not unhappy and that your once loved celestina is not become hateful to you believe me i shall rejoice in your happiness wherever found do not then refuse to assist me in obtaining not happiness for that is nowhere to be found for me but in obtaining that degree of content and resignation which may enable me to go through life without regretting the hour that i ever received it this willoughby is in your power and you must be greatly changed indeed if you refuse when you can so easily grant the last request that ever will be preferred to you by the unhappy but ever grateful and affectionate celestina de moray park street grosvenor square march twenty third seventeen hundred though by no means satisfied with her letter when she finished it she despaired of pleasing herself better she therefore sealed and sent it away by one of the footmen to the house of lady molyneux 
as she knew no other dress to willoughby the servant returned in about half an hour and told her that mr willoughby was not there but that he had sent in the letter and received but that he had sent in the letter and received a message that it should be taken care of and delivered to him she had flattered herself that if not a kind at least an immediate answer would put an end to the almost insupportable state of anxiety which she had been in ever since she saw him if he wrote to her with kindness it would she thought soothe and console her if he treated her by letter with as much coldness and disdain as he did during their short interview she hoped that resentment would support her and that through her pride might be wounded her affection would torment her less she was now however to wait perhaps a whole day in anxiety and what was more dreadful be compelled to sustain this anxiety under the appearance of calmness if not of cheerfulness for lady horatia who had made an engagement with some of her friends to go to the opera whither she seldom went herself on purpose to gratify celestina by hearing a new and celebrated performer did not seem at all disposed to relish the proposal she had ventured to hint at breakfast of being left out of the party of the evening and though she was generally very desirous that celestina should in all matters follow her own inclinations yet there were times when she seemed to expect some sacrifices to be made to her her grateful heart was extremely sensible of all the kindness of lady horatia who from having taken into her protection quite a stranger was now so attached to her that her happiness seemed her first object having no very strong affection for her only surviving brother who was a man immersed in politics and without pretence to natural affection and having been torn early in life from a man she loved and married by her father to one towards whom she was indifferent having since followed her three children who alone had reconciled her to her lot to their early graves her heart had been insensible to what are commonly called friendships and she had for some years rather sought to amuse than to connect herself but the graces of celestina's mind the sweetness of her disposition and the goodness of her heart had won upon her that the apathy of wearied sensibility which she had so long been in gradually gave place to an affection almost as tender as she could have felt had she been her mother and this affection created by merit was strengthened by the resemblance which continually struck her between celestina and her younger brother who lost his life in america the loss which among all her misfortunes she most severely lamented her increasing tenderness for celestina made her often reflect with uneasiness on her situation and very earnestly wished to see her married she was very sensible that her own life was not a good one for early calamity had shaken her constitution and brought on in the early autumn of her days the infirmities of old age and she knew that after having taken her as her daughter and accustomed her to share all the indulgencies which her own rank and income procured it would be a very painful reverse of fortune were she to leave her in the narrow circumstances in which she found her to save much of her jointure had never been her wish and was hardly now in her power her own fortune in default of children returned to her brother and all she had to dispose of was about two thousand pounds this she gave by a will made in the fourth month of their being together to celestina and with this and what she before had she thought that celestina might 
if married to Montague Thurgood, enjoy through life that easy competence which was the utmost of her ambition. The embarrassed circumstances of Willoughby, which the good-natured world had always exaggerated, and which Lady Horatia had considered as irretrievable, his very expensive place at Alvinstone, which she knew it required a large fortune to keep up, the doubtful birth of Celestina, whom she always fancied too nearly related to him, and some prejudice against him, merely because he was the brother of Lady Molyneux, whom she so very much disliked, all combined to raise in the mind of Lady Horatia a desire to impede every step towards the reunion of Celestina and Willoughby, and to promote her alliance with Montague Thurgood, near whose residence, wherever it was, she proposed to take a house in summer, and to have them frequently with her in winter at her house in town. Though she had not disclosed all her intentions, Celestina yet knew enough to be deeply sensible of the uncommon generosity of her friend, and the whole study of her life was to shrew that she was so. She made it a rule never to oppose the wishes of Lady Horatia, whenever they were clearly expressed, and therefore it was that she had often, contrary to her own judgment and her own inclinations, suffered the acidities of Montague Thurgood, and seemed to the world to give him that encouragement, the ill effects of which she endeavoured to counteract, by ingeniously declaring to him the impossibility her ever making the return he expected to his affection. Too certain that Lady Horatia would be disappointed, if not displeased, if she declined this evening to go out, and not having courage to tell her the step she had taken in regard to writing to Willoughby, she was compelled to struggle with her uneasiness and to attempt concealing if she could not conquer it. But every rap at the door which seemed to be that of a servant made her tremble, and while sitting at work before dinner she could not help going to the window several times, nor listening to every sound that she heard in the hall. Time wore away, and her impatience increased, and at length grew so evident that Lady Horatia remarked at it. "'What is the matter, my dear?' inquired she. "'Do you expect any one?' Celestina, conscious that she was betraying herself, and fearing least she should be blamed for what she had done, of which she began already to repent as too humiliating, blushed at this question so deeply that had not Lady Horatia been intent at the moment on her work, her suspicions must have been heightened. Celestina, however, not immediately answering, she repeated her question. Do you expect anybody? Twenty reasons might have been given for her seeming anxiety, and twenty people might have been named as likely to call but not one of all those occurred to Celestina. But not one of all these occurred to Celestina, who was little practiced in dissimulation. She therefore answered faintly, No, and in hopes of turning Lady Horatia's attention from her, and of hiding what she felt, she proposed finishing the perusal of a poem which Montague Thurgood had begun reading the preceding morning. Do so, said Lady Horatia. Celestina took up the book and began, but had no idea of what she was about, and of course read so extremely ill and so unlike her usual manner that Lady Horatia, looking at her very earnestly, said, Surely, Celestina, surely something is the matter. No, indeed, madam, replied she nothing except perhaps some slight remains of nervous agitation from the circumstances of last night. Try, my dear, to conquer that, replied Lady Horatia, and think of regaining the composure you possessed before, which such a circumstance, 
fairly considered ought not to destroy celestina sighed and to avoid the necessity of giving an answer went on with the book before her she had hardly however read ten lines when a servant brought in a letter and gave it to her she turned paler than death as she took it and the book fell from her hands lady horotia whose attention was now fixed upon her eagerly asked from whom the letter was celestina had by this time read it for it was only a note from a young friend for whose painting she had promised to give some pattern she put it down it was only from miss clayton madam said she about the patterns i am drawing for her dear child cried lady horotia and is all this trembling and anxiety this faltering and solicitude about miss clayton's patterns celestina i am afraid you are not ingenious with me surely i deserve that you should be so celestina felt that this accusation of want of confidence and the claim made to it was equally just the measure she had adopted at the risk of displeasing her best friend had produced nothing but some hours of anguish and would end probably in the conviction that willoughby despised and condemned her for it was now five o'clock and it was very improbable that he should not in all the hours that had intervened since she wrote have been at his lodgings or have had time to acknowledge the receipt of her letter this mortifying reflection and the consciousness that she ought to have consulted lady horotia quite overwhelmed her she was pale and silent a moment and then recovering her voice with difficulty said i believe i have acted so foolishly so improperly that i dare hope you will forgive me lady horotia expressed her uneasiness and surprise celestina in a tremendous voice told her what she had done pity rather than anger was created by the recital certainly my dear child said lady horotia had you consulted me i should have advised you against writing to mr willoughby situated as you both are no advances should have come from you if he is convinced that you are so related to him as to make every thought of you beyond such as that relationship authorizes guilty and odious he should surely on his coming to england have sent to you if he was unwilling to see you and have behaved with humanity and brotherly tenderness though love were for ever out of the question if he is not convinced of it how will you account for his conduct but by supposing that influenced by pecuniary motives or by caprice his desirous of forgetting all his former affection for you and yet has not that generous openness of character which would urge him to quit you handsomely to the truth of these remarks celestina had nothing to object but their justice cruelly depressed her and her sick heart recoiled from the idea of being obliged to appear in public again she ventured very gently to insinuate a wish to be left at home that evening if you are really ill you shall said lady horotia but otherwise i hope you will go i am not really ill replied celestina if your ladyship means only bodily suffering but my spirits my mind for the maladies of those interrupted lady horotia there is no remedy more sure than change of scene and variety of amusement and believe me dear celestina believe me and i have suffered much from the maladies of the mind they only grow by indulgence if we would conquer we must contend with and not encourage them you will suffer much less to-night if you are in a circle of friends who love and admire you than in brooding at home over the defection of one 
who if he ever did certainly does not deserve you i beg therefore that you will go celestina unaccustomed to dispute any wish of her friend yielded with as good a grace as she could to her remonstrances and with a heavy and aching heart went to finish her dress the hour of going out arrived and celestina found montague through good and mr and a mr howard in relation to lady horotia's ready to attend them as there was no escape she endeavored to assume the semblance of tranquillity and to talk with them on indifferent matters but the idea that willoughby had left london without seeing her or being still in it disdained to answer her letter and utterly refused to notice her hung so heavy on her heart that she could with difficulty support herself while the protracted state in which she had been since the preceding evening occasioned such ferment in her blood that her cheeks were of feverish crimson and the languid lustre of her fine eyes never appeared to greater advantage deep sighs which she tried in vain to suppress stole from her heart and mr howard rallied her upon them with a sort of commonplace wit which is so unusual and so irksome where there is real uneasiness to contend with while montague thoroughgood answered every sigh of hers by one yet deeper of his own and watched every turn of her countenance with trembling solicitude lady horotia was to join another party at the opera and celestina was in hopes that by obtaining a seat in one of the last rows in the box she should be excused from the task of seeming to give any attention either to the performance or the people around her this therefore she contrived to do and montague thoroughgood placed herself by her her thoughts were engrossed wholly by willoughby and the cruelty of his refusing to answer her letter she saw not the objects about her she attended not to the humble and plaintive voice of thoroughgood who now and then spoke to her when lady horotia howard turning to her bade her remark that in the opposite box had just entered lady castlenorth and her daughter celestina instantly saw them and as instantly concluded that willoughby's conduct towards her was owing to his being on the point of marriage with miss fitzhaman she had hardly felt her heart sink under this cruel idea before willoughby himself appeared and lady castlenorth making room for him he sat down between her and her daughter a look from the penetrating eyes of lady horotia howard made celestina turn away her head but she then met the anxious and inquiring eyes of montague thoroughgood and again sought refuge in looking towards the pit hardly knowing where she was and not daring again to trust herself with the sight of the group placed immediately opposite to her willoughby saw her not and after a while her eyes in despite of the pain she felt sought him again his countenance did not wear expressions of bridal felicity he was she thought paler and thinner than the night before and on his brow some corrosive sorrow seemed to hang but miss fitzhaman gay and animated talked to him incessantly and both she and her mother endeavored to engross his attention by a flow of conversation he listened to them but celestina fancied with more politeness than pleasure he smiled but she thought his smiles were the smiles of complacence and not of content still however his appearance in public with them was enough to convince her that his marriage was not far off her heart sunk at this sad certainty for though she had long since endeavoured to wean her mind from the hopes of ever being his she had still too keen recollections 
of that time when it was the first wish of both their hearts and she was prepossessed with an idea she hardly knew why that with miss fitzhaman he would be miserable that they had been parted by the artifice of lady castlenorth she now more than ever suspected but how willoughby could be cheated into such a belief and if he was why he should entirely throw off as a relation her home as the chosen mistress of his heart he had so fondly cherished she could not comprehend or could she in any way reconcile his conduct with that manly and liberated spirit which he had so eminently marked his character as she gazed on his face as on that of a stranger the husband of miss fitzhaman that face which she had been accustomed to contemplate with so much tenderness and when she considered that lost to her for ever she now dared no longer to look up to him as a friend whom she had once hoped to find through life her fond and generous protector her reflections to become too bitter and had she not feared that her going out would have attracted his eyes towards her and known that montague thoroughgood would have attended her which she desired to avoid she would have returned home for her sufferings were almost insupportable she hoped however to escape without his seeing her and shrunk back as much as she could pretending that her headache made the light particularly uneasy to her montague thoroughgood though knowing too well the real source of her uneasiness was yet anxious as she was that willoughby might not see her and favoured her concealment as much as he could towards the end of the opera however willoughby who seemed very weary of his seat left it to speak to somebody he saw in the pit celestina saw him very near the box where she sat and became so faint that she was afraid she must have sunk from her seat but her suffering still increased when a moment afterwards mr howard who sat next to her called to him and got up to speak to him in answering his question willoughby turned towards him his eyes immediately fell on celestina and montague thoroughgood close beside her an expression of mingled anger and scorn rose instantly in his countenance he abruptly broke off his conversation with mr howard and walked away in a moment celestina saw him rejoin lady castlenorth and miss fitzhaman she saw him affect to enter into conversation with them but that it was all effort his eyes once or twice were turned towards her but immediately withdrawn as if they had met a bast lisk and after a very few minutes she saw by his manner that he complained of the heat of the house pleaded indisposition and left them celestina overwhelmed with sensations too much to be borne began to think the opera never would end and that lady horatia who saw her distress had never before had so little compassion at length it was finished and that as montague thoroughgood handed her to the coach she besought him not to stay supper if lady horatia should ask him for i must in that case stay you know to entertain you and really i am so unwell that it is cruelty to expect it of me gratified by the power of obeying her even when her wishes were contrary to his own and full hope that this last struggle between her lingering love for willoughby and the certainty of his having left her for another would terminate his own favour thoroughgood promised to be wholly governed by her and took his leave at the door well celestina said lady horatia as soon as they were alone you are now i think convinced that willoughby is 
like most other men, capricious and unfeeling. What was his conduct tonight, but the most insulting that it was possible to assume, and after receiving a letter too from you, which you confess was couched in the tenderest and most submissive terms, which, as a gentleman, he ought to have answered, had you never had any claim whatever upon him i hope and believe however that such conduct will have the happiest effect that of weaning you for ever from that excessive partiality which from early prejudice you always appear to me to think it merit to cherish if he quitted you as he pretended on account of the doubts raised in his mind by the sorceress lady castlenorth why does he not those doubts being now certainties own you as his sister and become your protector as relation why if they are not ascertained does he poorly shrink from the inquiry and invade under such paltry pretences the engagements which you would surely release him from if told that he no longer wishes to accomplish them celestina tried to speak but could not articulate and lady horatia whose indignation against willoughby seemed to increase by indulgence went on let me conjure you then my dear celestina to exert that large share of reason with which you are endowed and expelling from your mind all that has passed try to look forward to happier prospects to prospects unclouded by doubt and undarkened by the gloomy apprehensions of being despised by the family of your husband and of being reproached as having embarrassed his fortune time and reason the assiduous tenderness of a man who really adores you will conquer all remains of regret and you will by degrees learn to think of willoughby and of all the events of your early life with the most perfect indifference celestina thought that was impossible but altogether unable to enter into the argument she could only sigh and in a tremendous voice entreat to be permitted to retire saying that in the morning she should have she hoped more resolution and have got the better of the agitation of her spirits sleep however refused to visit her the image of willoughby cruel and capricious as he was incessantly haunted her having been long used to study his countenance she understood all his expressions and when she had courage to fix her eyes on him during the opera no turn of it escaped her all the comfort she could derive to herself from those observations was believing that his attention to miss fitzhaman was forced and that the solicitude with which she herself was avoided arose rather from some remains of tenderness than from total indifference surely said she if he felt nothing for me he would not fly from me but treat me with polite indifference or with that candor and openness of heart which used to be so natural to him he would avow his designs and give reasons for them for he knows that be his intentions or motives what may play I shall never reproach him, but whatever I may feel for myself, rejoice, if he can find happiness. Thus, the real affection of heart for Willoughby counteracted the effect of that native pride and dignity of soul, which under other circumstances would have supported her, and even of his quitting her, without finding that unanswerable reason for it which was supposed to exist she thought rather in sorrow than in anger the morning came and uninteresting to her she expected nothing but a repetition of common irksome occurrences 
with the suspense and misery of not hearing from willoughby lady horatia's remonstrance montague thoroughgood's silence but assiduous attendance company whom she wished not to see or parties abroad that could afford her no pleasure the day and another and another wore away and still no letter from willoughby arrived the forlorn hope which she had till now fondly cherished that he still retained a lingering preference for her in his heart now faded away and an almost certain conviction succeeded that he not only quitted her for ever but disclaimed her even as a friend and gave her up in silent contempt without either offering her the protection of a relation or feeling for the regret which the loss of a pleasant acquaintance would once she thought have given him she repented she had concealed the letter she had written from lady horatia howard and while she was conscious that she ought to have no reserve towards her she felt that in her present anxious state of suspense it would be some consolation to talk it over with her friend but far from soothing her with hope and attempting to account for the silent neglect of willoughby by any means that might palliate its cruelty lady horatia exhorted her more earnestly than, than ever to call off her thoughts from a man who was considered in every light so unworthy to possess them and she urged more earnestly than she had ever done her wishes that the tender and generous attachment of montague thoroughgood might be immediately rewarded though to the necessity of giving herself to another celestina could by no means agree yet she felt that she must either learn to think with more calmness of her eternal separation from willoughby or sink under it for such pain as the undecided wretchedness of the last two or three days had given her human nature could not long sustain she promised lady horatia that she would endeavour to regain her tranquillity but besought her for a day or two to excuse her from mixing with company and that in the meantime nothing might be said to montague thoroughgood to give him more encouragement than he had already received from the looks of willoughby when she had seen her with him and from his present disdainful silence she supposed he believed her engaged to him and either resented her for having entered into such an engagement without consulting him or still felt some pain in believing she had given herself to another of which she could not help owning there was every appearance from their being so frequently together and from the report which had gone forth which her protectress had not only left uncontradicted but had rather encouraged of montague thoroughgood therefore she now thought with concern and disquiet as being partially the cause of the uneasiness she suffered from the certainty which every hour in its flight confirmed that willoughby had taken leave of her for ever end of the third volume end of volume three chapter ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c